Imagine standing in a fog-choked valley, 1.8 million years ago, the air thick with the scent of damp earth and distant decay. You hear a low, guttural hum not quite human, not quite animal echoing from the shadows. Then, through the mist, you see them, hunched figures with elongated skulls, jagged teeth, and eyes that glint with primal intelligence. These are your ancestors, but they're nothing like you imagined. They're the creepiest hominins you've never heard of being, who scavenged in darkness, crafted tools from bone, and maybe even buried their dead in ways that feel eerily familiar. What drove them to survive in a world of saber-toothed cats and endless night, and why do their stories make us shiver today? Welcome to a journey into the strangest corners of our family tree, where the line between human and monster blurred. Buckle up, this is going to be a wild, unsettling ride. Picture a rocky gorge in what's now Demonacy, Georgia, 1.8 million years ago. The sun barely pierces the heavy mist, and the ground is littered with bonesome animal, some not. Here, Homo Georgicus roamed, a hominin so ancient it feels like a ghost from our past. These were small creatures, barely four feet tall, with brains half the size of ours. Yet their skulls, found in the 1990s, tell a chilling story. Their teeth were worn down, not from chewing plants, but from gnawing on bones. These weren't noble hunters. They were scavengers, creeping through the twilight to steal scraps from predators, kills. Imagine them, crouched over a carcass, their crude stone tools scraping marrow, while hyenas howled nearby. What kind of courage or desperate them to live like this, their world was a brutal one, filled with giant cheetahs and saber-toothed cats. Survival meant embracing the darkness, becoming shadows themselves. The creepiest part, their skeletal remains show signs of injuries that healed, suggesting they cared for each other, even in this merciless place. How did such small, vulnerable, beings find the will to endure? Let's zoom in on those tools rough, jagged stones that Homo Georgicus clutched like lifelines. These weren't just rocks, they were extensions of their will to survive. Archaeologists found hundreds of these, tools in Diaminazi, some stained with traces of blood and bone. The implication is eerie, these hominins weren't just scavenging, they were methodical, cracking open bones to suck out marrow or slicing flesh from abandoned kills. Their small brains didn't stop them from mastering their environment in a way that feels almost too human. But here's the unsettling twist. Some tools were made from the bones of their own kind. A cracked hominin femur, sharpened into a point, suggests they didn't just scavenge animals, they repurposed their dead. Was this pragmatism or something darker? Picture a group huddled around a fire, shaping a fallen companion's bone into a tool under the flickering light. Did they mourn, or was death just another resource? Their world forces us to confront a question. What separates survival from savagery? These ancestors, so distant yet so familiar, blur that line in a way that sends shivers down our spine. The Demonese finds get even creepier when you consider one skull known as Skull 5. It belonged to an elderly Homo Georgicus who lived long past losing most of their teeth. In a world where strength meant survival, how did this toothless elder endure? The answer lies in the group. Evidence suggests others chewed food for them, a level of care that feels shockingly human. This wasn't just survival instinct was community, maybe even love, in a world that offered neither freely, but there's a haunting flip side. Some archaeologists believe these hominins buried their dead, or at least left them in specific places, like caves, where bones piled up. Over generations, why? Was it ritual, or just convenience? Imagine a dark cave, filled with the remains of your kin, their empty eye sockets staring back as you add another body. It's a scene that feels straight out of a horror story, yet it's part of our story, Homo Georgicus forces us to ask. When did we start caring for each other, and when did we start fearing the dead? Their lives, so raw and primal. Hold a mirror to our own humanity and, it's not always a comforting reflection, deep in Siberia's Altai Mountains. 50,000 years ago, a cave yawns open like a mouth to the underworld. Denisova Cave, cloaked in frost and mystery, was home to the Denisovans hominins we know from just a few bones and teeth. Yet their story is hauntingly strange. These ancestors weren't small, like Homo Jujicus. Their jaws were massive, their teeth enormous hinting at a strength that could crush bone. But what makes them creepy isn't their size, it's their elusiveness. We've never found a full Denisovan skeleton, only fragments, a finger bone, a jaw, a few molars. Yet, their DNA lives on in modern humans, especially in people from Oceania and Asia. Picture them in that frozen cave, their breath steaming in the dark as they faced winters that could kill in hours. What kind of beings thrived in such a desolate place? Their tools, found scattered in the cave, were sophisticated bone needles, polished stone beads. Were they crafting clothes or ornaments? Were they decorating themselves, or something else? The Denisovans feel like ghosts, their presence lingering in our genes, but their lives shrouded in questions that chill the soul. The Denisovans didn't just survive, they mingled. Genetic evidence shows they interbred with Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens, passing on DNA that helped humans adapt to high altitudes and harsh climates. 
But this interbreeding raises eerie questions. What did these encounters look like? Were they peaceful, trading tools and stories under starlit skies? Or were they violent, born of conflict in a world where survival was a zero-sum game? Imagine a Denisovan and a Neanderthal meeting in the cave's dim light. Their differences stark, yet their desires familiar. The creepiest part is how their DNA hints at multiple mixing events, suggesting not just one encounter but a pattern, maybe even communities living together. And then there's the jewelry, those polished beads and bone pendants. Were these gifts, status symbols, or something more ritualistic? Some artifacts suggest they pierced animal bones with eerie precision, possibly for ceremonies we can only guess at. What gods or spirits did they worship in that frozen darkness? Their secrecy, their half-known lives, make the Denisovans feel like specters and sisters who shaped us but left only whispers of their existence. The Denisovans' creepiest legacy might be their hints of spirituality. In Denisova Cave, archaeologists found a bracelet, green chlorite polished to a sheen, too delicate for everyday use. Was it a burial offering, a charm against the cold, or a mark of something sacred? Picture a Denisovan, their massive hands, trembling as they placed this bracelet beside a body, the cave's walls echoing with chants we'll never hear. Some researchers speculate they practiced rituals, maybe even proto-burials, laying their dead in specific chambers. Why else would so many bones human and animal pile up in one place? This wasn't just a home, it was a sanctuary of sorts, a place where the living and dead coexisted. The thought is unsettling. Did they fear their dead or revere them? Did they see death as an end or a doorway? Their world, frozen and harsh, forced them to confront mortality in ways that feel both alien and intimate. The Denisovans remind us that even in the deepest past, our ancestors grappled with questions of meaning, leaving behind fragments that haunt us still. What did they see in the dark that we've forgotten? Now, let's travel to Flores Island, Indonesia, 50,000 years ago, a place that feels like a fever dream. Here, in the steamy jungles and jagged caves, lived Homo floresiensis, nicknamed the hobbits, for their tiny stature, barely three feet tall. But don't let their size fool, youthies hominins were predators in a world straight out of a nightmare. Picture a landscape teeming with giant rats, venomous Komodo dragons, and towering storks with beaks like spears. Homo floresiensis wasn't just surviving, they were hunting, using stone tools to take down creatures far larger than themselves. Their skeletons, found in Liangbua Cave in 2003, reveal oversized feet and long, grasping toes. Perfect for scrambling through dense forests. But their small brains smaller than a chimpanzee's make, their cunning, all the creepier. How did these pint-sized hunters thrive in such a hostile world? Imagine them stalking through the undergrowth, their eyes gleaming with focus, dodging, redditors that could swallow them whole. Their existence feels like a dark fairy tale, a story of resilience that's equal parts inspiring and unsettling. What drove these tiny terrors to dominate their island? The creepiness of Homo floresiensis deepens when you look at their lifestyle. These hobbits weren't just scavenging like Homo georgicus or hiding like Denisovans, they were apex predators. In their own right, archaeologists found bones of juvenile elephants, called stegodon, with cut marks from stone tools, suggesting the hobbits hunted in packs, taking down prey many times their size. Picture a group of these tiny figures, their oversized feet gripping the earth, surrounding a panicked elephant calf under a moonlit canopy. Their tools, though simple, were deadly sharpened flakes of volcanic rock that could slice through hide, but here's the chilling part. Their small brains didn't limit their ingenuity. They used fire, as evidenced by charred bones in Liang Biwa Cave, and possibly traps to outsmart larger animals. Were they fearless, or just desperate? Their world was a gauntlet of danger, with Komodo dragons lurking and giant birds swooping from above. Yet, they thrived for tens of thousands of years. How does something so small become so fierce? The hobbits force us to rethink what it means to be a predator and why they're tiny. Ruthless shadows still haunt us. The story of Homo floresiensis ends in mystery, and that's what makes it so eerie. Around 50,000 years ago, they vanished, leaving only their bones in that damp cave. What happened? Some say a volcanic eruption choked their island in ash, while others point to climate change or the arrival of modern humans. Imagine the last hobbit, alone in Liang Bua, surrounded by the bones of their kin, the jungle outside growing silent. Did they know their time was ending? Their tools and fire pits suggest a culture, maybe even stories whispered in the dark but we'll never know what they believed or feared. The creepiest detail is their isolation. Flores was an island, a world apart, where they evolved into something unique yet doomed. Their oversized feet and tiny frames feel like a warning. Even the fiercest can fade. Today, locals on Flores tell tales of Ebugogo, small, hairy creatures who stole food and whispered in the night. Are these echoes of Homo floresiensis lingering in folklore? Their story leaves us uneasy, wondering how close we came to being like them small, fierce, and forgotten in a world too big to conquer. 
from the bone-gnawing scavengers of Demonisi to the ghostly Denisovans and the hobbit-like hunters of Flores, our ancestors were as strange as they were resilient. They faced worlds of darkness, ice, and monsters, yet left traces of care, ritual, and cunning that echo in us today. What's creepiest isn't their alienist, it's how human they feel, despite their jagged teeth or tiny frames. They remind us that humanity isn't just about survival. It's about the stories we tell, the dead we honor, and the fears we carry. So, what do you think? Could you survive their worlds, or would their shadows haunt you too? If this journey into our creepy past made you think differently, hit that subscribe button and join us to uncover more of our untold history. Let's keep exploring the mysteries of who we really are.